Okay, let's talk together. So um, I think this topic, I, I look at this topic every year that we look at the American dream because hard work is such an important part of how we talk about the American dream. But this year above all others, I think this is a really fascinating topic. Have you guys heard about this like anti-work movement that is going on or the great resignation or uh, the great quit, depending on what you know, you've heard about? So it's not necessary. It's not just teachers. There's a huge teacher shortage right now, and it's just going to get really worse, a lot worse. Um, but <laughs> you would think, okay. not. <laughs> <laughs> which is why they're worried about. No, it's okay. I just I just read a stat yesterday that sixty percent of teachers in Texas are strongly considering leaving this year. Sixty percent. That's not in Utah. That's in Texas. I don't know that they've done that stat in Utah. But that's sixty. All right, but that's beside the point. I'm not just talking about teachers. I mean, I think there have been resignations in every situation. Or how many of you guys work? Um, at your job, is there, are they hiring or is there a shortage of labor? Always hired. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was not always the case, right? Like, um, it's part of the reason that people in like jobs like mine or nursing or whatever are really unsatisfied is because in order to fill these other positions, they've had to like raise wages so high at some of the jobs you guys are working at that some of you per hour are probably making more than some of your teachers because they are just having such a hard time getting people to work in these sort of like essential jobs, right? Um, essential in big quotations there, but essential jobs. So there's that kind of movement going on where people are just like really fed up. What have you heard about people like why they're resigning? Yeah. People not being paid enough have no benefits. Okay, good. So it's like maybe they're being kept part time and not have any benefits. Maybe their job doesn't offer any benefits. They're just it's not meeting their salary. Sort of like recommend not recommendations, but like needs. Selena. Um, they can't use their job. Yeah, I think like the restrictions, like the restrictions were really difficult. So a lot of you guys in the service industry that had to deal with like all the masks and people who were really rude to you because they didn't want to wear masks. I think that got people really fed up. Um, and maybe, I mean, in other things, like in the healthcare industry, they're just being like overrun with like the amount of work. So they're getting burned out. I think the lack of respect between management and the Okay, so I had you guys researching like wage distribution, right? And um, you saw like how much the people at the top make versus the people at the bottom. And I think that's getting down to this individual level of worker where they're looking at what their boss makes versus what they make. And they feel there seems to be this like lack of respect, not just in the wages, but in the way that they're being valued. Yeah. I think a lot of people, especially with COVID, when we were all, all from big calendars and media as you know, essential workers, we're gonna save us. But then as COVID goes on, once the COVID folks keep just keeps reflecting, they're no longer essential workers. They're just way underpaid. And yeah. And then they see the news of the billionaires getting insane amounts to the point where the top 1% earns, I think, more wealth than the bottom 50. I don't remember the stats, like but it might even be more I think a lot of people are seeing their wages go up. So they're like, you know, maybe this is kind of okay so maybe it also is related to um, not just like wage gaps increasing but also like inflation going up too so you see like during covid jeff bezos made not that COVID's over but like the you know the in 2020 jeff bezos made millions and millions of dollars because nobody could leave their house they're all ordering on amazon right and yet like you still have the grocery store worker who on top of you know, not getting paid very much now has healthcare costs because they got COVID because they're essential and they have to go to, they have to keep going to work. You know, it's just like the way that people are reaching. Uh, Alistair. I think a lot of people are also starting to notice, like, if you're working at a restaurant and you sell, or like Starbucks, I guess, in your instance, and you sell, like, really expensive, large coffee or whatever, it's like, oh, uh, and then they're making 
seven dollars an hour for what they're making on those copies that they audit. They're not getting back what they actually produce in terms of the Right. Um, I want to say that might have been part of your last argument about like product about like our worker production going up, like our productivity. Was that yours? Yeah. yeah, that productivity has gone up astronomically, and yet wages haven't matched that. So we feel like we're working harder and harder, but we don't know where that stuff is going. We actually are working harder and harder. Including you as a student, you're working harder and harder as students, and yet we don't know where like how that effort is going to be rewarded. Mm -hmm. Josie, I think you see like. Um, you know, you can to also like the workers and the people who are in the position to really or like just customers in general or people mm. who like just are like, oh yeah, these are the people who are just like like enjoying and, the services. Yeah, enjoying yeah. the services, like right. Like, oh you give me coffee dogs and they're like, oh, okay, whatever, like you didn't need this, you need that. Yeah. And so I'm I'm here, I'm gonna go out and do right. this or do this and this is what I'm gonna do. Right. And there seems to be also like for people who are leaving their jobs or who are sit, coming back on hours because they're burnt out from this kind of behavior, they seem to have more options too. Not just in employment, because over the pandemic, a lot of people had a chance to get better certifications and more education and so on. So they don't only have more choices in terms of employment, but also we have way more people who are moving back in with their parents and just saying like, oh, this stuff is not worth it anymore. We have more people who are like cohabitating to find different living arrangements. Um, there's like all sorts of ways people are cutting back so that they don't have to actually work um, in these situations. Yeah, awesome. So I know some people So it, this isn't just about them like not being treated right, it's about like having a living wage, but part of what we refer to when we say living wage has to be health care. And if they're going to put their self, themselves at risk, they were worried about a job that they health care. Yeah, Kaylee? I know. So, like, in the job I'm doing, pay for skills I'm working at, and it asks if I tutor kids. Oh, and yeah, that's the issue. Yeah. Pay three hundred dollars a month, but I only get paid twelve dollars an hour. Yeah. And so, like, it, I can see like this discrepancy in what my company's making with what I'm doing, and if I tutor, like, an overqualified person who can't tutor. Yeah, and maybe a lot of people are feeling yeah, that way that they're overqualified. It's saying about like. Him trying to hire people at this company that's demanding more. Interesting. And they are overqualified, so they're demanding more, or the company doesn't want people who are overqualified? Um, I think it's my dad personally doesn't want to have to do that to them because uh, he, he wants them to go and do better, but they're yeah. getting paid better elsewhere right now. Yeah. Yeah, you think about like, what so to go to our first question about like how we value different kinds of labor it is interesting that kaylee's making 12 dollars an hour and i don't want to call anyone out but like just silently in your head do you work in a job where you make more than 12 dollars an hour and it's not like tutoring kids i mean i i i think there if you're not you should go out and look because there are a lot of places right now that are paying like 18 19 you know, just at McDonald's and stuff. So go and look. Wendy's had to shut down the other day because they didn't have enough people working there. Yeah, that. I think there's something where it's like people aren't like being respected enough. And it's also like that overqualification. Like I worked at a movie theater in December and I'm mean, getting, I've been there for like eight months and I was there getting paid like 10 bucks an hour. Ooh. And then I'm like, hey, can I just have like three days off around Christmas? But no, we need all of you. And I'm like, Okay, like I'm just like, I got, and they're like, <laughs> they're like, okay, you can't leave, they won't rehire you. And like 70% of us like quit. Like we were always right. like, screw this. It's we're like, 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 that's fine, don't rehire like, me. I do, like, I'm like, I know how to run everything in here. So if I'm not like, you'll get like three days off, this is ridiculous. And it was like, all of us just like quit. Like this is, we're way too qualified to get treated yeah. like garbage. And for like $10, like so maybe it's $10. about workers sort of understanding their own worth better now too. Yeah. Brennan? Well, uh, so the house, if anyone knows anything about the housing market. Shh, shh, shh. Yeah, and it's I, rough. I moved this year, and I think it was, Word. I got extremely lucky to be in a place where there was people like me or a more people like me. Yeah. And like, I think it's pretty telling that people's wages have been 
like way lower than it should be. When when most I feel like most young people's uh, future housing plan is waiting for the economy to crash. So maybe yeah. Just your life yeah. Plan. yeah. I. Yeah. So I'm part of this like elder millennial generation, right? For those who are like solid millennials, like that's how, that's what I hear from them. It's just like, yeah, we're not gonna have houses. Like that's, that's done for us, you know? Um, and if we want to, we'll have to move to like Roy or something that's like, you know, not where you wanna live, not where the jobs are. So there's this way then that if people don't see sort of the efforts of their labor paying off in the kind of like standard version of the American dream, they might just drop out of this whole system altogether and just say, okay, fine. Well, then I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to live in my trailer park that I can afford. Not that that's a good investment, by the way, but uh, I'm going to live in this trailer that I can afford with my friends rather than like try and play this game anymore. Sabina? So I don't like to make Yes, I think that that was a big issue at, at the beginning. That's run out in Utah now. I think it's been like a year and a half. So at this point, I mean, even if you saved all of it, every penny, you it would be gone. I would assume. I don't know. I went to France. <laughs> I gave all, all my economy boosting money to the French. How do we feel? Um, anyway, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I think another problem that like people really have to deal with is because like the company has all these things that they actually can't really do. So like I've been working at a company for like a year now, and I'm always like, I promise I'll get it away from here. Oh really? They've never gotten followed through with that. Okay. Feel like that's happening to like every company. Yeah. So it's like the, the disconnect between like expectations and promises and the worker. I also agree with Sabina and everyone else. I just feel like all the times companies will like promise their workers like a lot of stuff and then they'll like not do it. Like when I started my job, I was like promised that I was gonna be paid more and then they like just did not pay us for like a month and a half. So literally oh. everyone is it a small company? Yeah. Well oh, okay. not that I like I'm a school teacher. So oh it's, okay. Like, it's like Whoa. Whoa. But anyways, um, yeah, but they didn't pay us for so long, and like we stayed just me and my friend. But it was like so stupid because like everyone quit, and like they totally deserved it. <laughs> but were they able to hire new people? Is like their business they done? They started hiring again, but like I swear they just lied to everyone because everyone joined and then they quit after they realized they were like real good. Ooh, so if you're looking for a school teacher job, talk to Claire before you <laughs> before you find one. But yeah, okay. So in that way, sometimes it feels like like protections are on the company side rather than the worker side. Like yeah. if you don't get paid for a month, but they told you that you should, shouldn't you be yeah. able to sue them and get exactly. your money? You know, and like you probably could. Like, Maybe, no but like didn't. how? You know, like it's it's yeah. you don't have the funds to hire the lawyer or the time to regroup or whatever. Oh, yeah. Not to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Like if you get into the finance thing, but like you might not be able to get in there for like a little bit longer. Yeah. Like say if the place that you work in is like a client of theirs and they don't want to pay you for like a year, or if they can get back to you for like a year or two or like a month fee, which I mean Yeah, so do we have this trade off then when we were talking about better, richer, fuller? Do we have a trade off where it also it can't be richer and fuller? You know, unless you're one of those people who's just like, I love real estate, I love finance, which they do exist, right? But are we, this goes back to our first question too, do we value the labor? that is most necessary for our society to function, do we value that the most? Um, and should we? Okay, Kaylee? So, kind of, what I was gonna say is like, kind of going back to this, there's a lot less, sorry, I don't need my name, um, more low-wage jobs, the ones that are apparently essential according to some people, um, we like don't value them very much at all. And like, the bigger companies or whatever, 
we take the change with us with a lot. Mm -hmm. And we've all seen that probably. <laughs> but like like a lot of them are younger, they don't know how to like fight back if we try something. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to get their money if we just want it. They don't understand how taxes work. So like so we can take that from them and we can clean whoever because nobody cares if you're underpaying or not here. Nobody notices. Yeah. Like those those jobs, even though society doesn't know what we do so we can have them, they are really valuable. Yeah, and I'm kind of like getting that impression from all of you guys. You feel like these sort of like essential jobs, the ones that were like uh, gas station clerks, grocery store workers, maybe like truck drivers, like stuff that we really depend on for our society to function are not as valued as much as other professions. Yes. So which ones do we value? Who are the, what are the jobs? What kind of the labor is the labor that we are like, that person's amazing. Okay, so like really specialized skills um, that none of us in this room could go and just stand in for that doctor and surgeon and do that work, you know? Um, that's, I think, I think one way that we can think about this, the really specialized stuff. Yeah. Yeah, Elsa. Oh, sorry. Yeah, like highly visible jobs. Um, so like entertainment industry, including like YouTubers or TikTokers or sports or actresses, musicians, and so on. Um, yeah, and we we kind of like, because all of us sort of like appreciate, it's not just at, you know, my neighborhood Smith's where I appreciate the clerk who checked out, you know, my groceries. It's like all of us can pay into the pocket of our favorite actor. It seems like that wealth accumulates faster for that person and we all sort of appreciate what they do. Aaliyah? Okay, come up. Wait, now I'm forgetting. Give me a second. <laughs> okay, wait. I think I, okay, I remember. Sure. I think we need to, like, the labor thing, but it's not as much as, like, the money. Right? You can, you can appreciate the people who make a lot of money, but it's not as much as the labor thing. So, like, why is the person making a lot of money, right? The person making a lot of money is, like, like a doctor, so they're going to get the vibe. Or are they making a lot of money because the entire company is out of business and they're not going to make their next year? So it's like, oh, you know, you bought this company. Yeah. Of being here. That kind yeah. of being appreciated because it's almost selfish, right? It's okay if you want to make money, but if you want to make money, like that's your goal in life, it should be appreciated because you don't also want to help people, you don't want to be biased in your favor. Yeah, so let me ask this, I'll go back to Leah. Um, so we say this like we, oh yeah, there's labor that we don't appreciate down at the bottom, right? But would you guys agree then that like there's also labor that we don't appreciate at the very top too. Like we kind of hate rich people a little bit too. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like they, they, maybe they don't deserve our appreciation. Like, you know, they have money. So what do they need my appreciation for? But there is a way that we kind of like can differentiate between the jobs that we find useful. So there's a difference between what we are paying people in terms of like giving them our appreciation through money. But there's a way that we kind of heroicize, is that a word? Like, turn someone into a hero, romanticize, romanticize maybe, yeah. um, like doctors and people who are like, we see as being like beneficial to the community too. So there's like, it's not as simple, I guess, as what you're saying. Aaliyah? I think that like, I've noticed throughout the years that like US history, that people who make lots of money, they're like, they're like, But we do love it. I yeah. see what you're saying. Like, yeah. Like, but we don't love going to school. No. <laughs> yeah. Like see these essential things that are getting paid less, but because people want like luxuries, the the more innovative things are and the better and easier the things might be to you are the people that get paid the most. Money. Yeah. If you're that one person I know, like specifically like in groups of people and then the rest of us are just taking one crown and walking away. Like not even Right. Okay. So this is so fascinating to me because this means that really the labor that we are like 
appreciating the very most that we like praise the most in our society is like innovation and entrepreneurs. And yet, if you are innovating correctly and being the right kind of entrepreneur, then that means that you shouldn't be working hard anymore, right? Like you did the you did the hard work for a couple of years, you made it. I, I maybe Jeff Bezos still works hard, but it seems like he has a lot of time to go into space. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know, like at a certain point, what we are really valuing, and maybe like maybe it's just me, but what I like sort of look forward to, right, is this time when you don't have to work hard. So does that mean that we actually do value hard work as this like great character building sort of thing for us? Can we go Brennan, Austin, and Audrey? I feel like with the internet, there's been this kind of fact that like, I, I think a great example is the, uh, I've seen this like kind of worship of Elon Musk in San Francisco. Uh -huh. and I think it's really, as an innovator, right? Yeah, because he's the innovator. Yeah. He's giving us all the time. When his cyber truck or whatever, it's like, <laughs> He relies on his engineers, his oh, basically right. literally everyone under him, but they all quit. He would be absolutely nothing. Uh -huh. At some point, I'm sure he had to be the innovator. The of it, uh -huh. like Elon Musk. <laughs> right. And it's kind of that he same idea. Values the engineer. Yes, Elon Musk values the engineer, but who we really, but who we value because he's the face of it is Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So at some point, Elon Musk. I don't know his history, but at some point, he was the innovator. Right, and then he got to this place where he could say, "What is it? A cyber truck? Yeah. Invent me a cyber truck, and that's really all he needs to do to innovate." Steve Jobs got to that point too, right? Like, invent me the iPod. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, and and so and yet that's who we are looking up to. Austin. Um, so I think we value the hard work that goes into like ethical jobs. So like we we really praise the people who like put in all the time to go to school and work hard and like pump out but then the people that have worked hard for a job that only benefits themselves we're kind of like oh ew like the people who are in sports they're getting paid tens of millions of dollars in the yeah. and we're all kind of just like this is stupid there's no point for you guys to be making this much money but and yet they still get to make that much money because all of us still appreciate what they are doing we all still say like i am gonna watch the super bowl oh. yeah <laughs> Uh, my aunt asked me last night who did the Super Bowl, and I was like, no, I feel like they wear orange. <laughs> <laughs> um, Audrey. Um, I just think there's like a stigma with like the lower jobs, like the gas station clerk or like the like I would say like go to school, get education, so you don't end up there. Right. And it's like somebody has to work there, but if we're all being told that like you don't want to work there, you have to go there. Yeah, exactly. Like we want people to give us the McFlurry. We enjoy the McFlurry. I would say the McFlurry is one of the better parts of my day, right? Like out of all the things that I'm doing, the stuff I get from McDonald's or Starbucks or whatever, it's like the joy of my day. And they are bringing so much joy to me by providing that to me, right? And yet we're just like, oh, doing that kind of labor, that's like the lowest of the low. I, I hope teachers don't do this anymore. But like, I remember when I was a kid, people would be like, what do you want to be flipping burgers for the rest of your life? And it was just, well, why not? <laughs> Okay, awesome. Oh, yeah, I feel like um, with like the self confidence prompt yes. earlier, is with everybody being like, oh, you don't want to do this, you don't want to do this, you don't want to do this, and we're all kind of like a failure. And so when we have to take our last regular job, and we feel like there's all this available, there's all this money, like we're just gonna take it one. Yeah. Like then you kind of do go back to like, like, oh, everybody told me that I'm like garbage as soon as I end up here. Like that's that happened to me too so like i went through this whole phd planning to be a professor in college um i found out that colleges mostly rely on adjunct labor now they're not hiring that many tenure track professors and adjunct labor you don't get health benefits you so people were teaching five when i started it i'm sure it's up now but when they were teaching five classes a semester i teach six so one more but they were teaching five and making twenty thousand a year like they they were yeah it was like nothing right um 
So I was like, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. Then I'm going to go into public education. And everybody sees this as like a huge step backwards. It was like, if you go into high and teach high school, you will not be able to get back into teaching college. It's not necessarily true everywhere, but at those big schools, like, you know, if, if, um, like let's say UCLA were to hire a teacher, if they saw that someone had been in secondary ed, they probably would say, we'll go with somebody else. They've got this like stigma about certain jobs, right? And yet they all rely on high school teachers to like build the students that they want at their colleges. So anyway, so I wanna think about that um, competitive spirit question then, because I think we're kind of seeing some of the results of having this competitive spirit um, because it's not just competition in who can produce more, but it's also competition into who has those highly prized jobs. Is there something else? Because this is where people are getting like really hung up on this anti-work idea. Like if you're not working, if you're not contributing to society through work, is that a bad thing? Is there something else that you could like see as a, a value rather than hard work? Brennan? I, I feel like a lot of people realize they're living paycheck to paycheck with what they like to call this like almost low pressure routines. And I think that's a lot of the problem is the complete lack of social safety nets in this country. Mm. In this I think like a lot of people, especially the lower class, one injury, like one injury, if your health insurance like doesn't pay it off, you're basically out. Yeah, right. You can't go back to your factory yeah, job. Like, yeah. And I feel like without um with people that can't like fall back on like help from like the government and stuff, they're not going to take risks or go into a highly specialized job or something because if it doesn't work out, they're screwed. Mm. You know? Okay, so then there's this way that like maybe something other than the competitive spirit that we could kind of hype up more than like hard work could be like social connections, community connections, community responsibilities. Maybe like or giving people the actual, like the safety nets from the government. Okay, yeah, just you said what you meant by the competitive spirit. Um, are you not wanting to work when you, or like, right, for example, like for your student clinic, are you not wanting to take time if you're like, if you don't try, or are you like, if you're not practicing, you feel like it's hard or whatever, mm -hmm. or are you like, oh, you know, like, are you like, maybe you're practicing, you're just being bored with it, not because it's hard, but because it's like probably mentally hard. Yeah. Like, Okay, good. So rather than this sort of like universal work ethic, you're thinking more about a personalized like way of understanding value in your own life. And you said like, maybe it's not a good idea if you're lazy and that's why you stop working. But if laziness makes you happy, is there anything wrong with being lazy? If I just like revel in laziness, is that like a morally corrupt place to be or can we celebrate laziness the same way we celebrate hard work and i'm not talking about taking breaks and or leisure even i'm like talking about like being lazy can that be as valuable as working hard i don't know awesome i feel like a competitive idea is just to say that um it's like cool for feeling a certain kind of way because like they want to do the job but then there will be employers who feel like oh <clears throat> It's just really hard to be able to find a balance because what you're saying is that some people have model and they're just like really competitive and they struggle that need the time to like take care of themselves. But with the employer, it's not as easy or easy. So you all I them. see. Um, this isn't a choice that the employer can or the employee can make. It has to be sort of a wider sort of shift in the way we value certain things. 
three characteristics, okay? I get that. Like, um, there are there are companies right now that are hiring teachers. They're snatching them up. I'm just always really nice to me because I basically have only taught as a job. <laughs> um, but they're like snatching up these teachers, right, to have them be like instructional designers, which means that you're like building trainings for employees of other companies. And I know from that's my husband that works at that kind of company, and their instructional designers work like I don't know, like thirty percent as much as I do. Like it's like and for a lot more money. So there are these ways that you can see that there are these other jobs that are so much easier than the essential jobs that have been, that we appreciate, but not with our money. And it seems a lot nicer to just go take the lazy option. Yeah, kid, kid user. Like, I honestly cannot tell. Me neither. Right. <laughs> or just lazy or just tired, too, or like lazy or burnt out. Like, yeah, every. I, I, you can't even tell. And you're taught that if, you're, if you have an issue, if you, if you need a break, that's lazy. Then. It's like, for to me, it's like, if, you, if you're not doing your homework, that's because you're lazy. It's mm -hmm. not because you need a break. It's not because you're yeah and it's social pressure that's sort of like coming through your parents a lot of times because your parents I think are afraid of all the social pressure so it's like if you aren't productive at all hours of the day then will you be successful will you be happy and it's just all this like fear okay one more comment Brennan I feel like a lot of people think that oh if people you know can just quit their job they just need to raise their jobs I don't think as many people are are like that as they think they just don't want to work at something they hate and I feel like as a society we should allow everyone whether they work or not to be able to have a roof over their head and food to eat and be able to sustain themselves yeah. and then put in labor that they want. But does anyone want to do some of those jobs? Like, does anyone want to stock grocery shelves? That's the problem. Yeah. Let's just make teenagers do this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm going to give you a piece of paper here now. <laughs> yeah, you're talking about like a universal basic income. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Always just go. <laughs> <laughs> I know. She doesn't have a lot. She's very high. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Your anti AP paper. Yes. All right. So, so we've now had this big long discussion about hard work as an ethic, um, and I guess as reality. You're gonna now write a thesis statement about hard work. <laughs> So remember how we were narrowing those down. Like it's not just about like hard work is good because it builds character. Like we were having like pretty specific discussions about why hard work has certain effects, why people are fed up and so on. And I wanna leave it a little bit more open for you today to talk about whichever aspect of that conversation you found the most interesting or whatever aspect you had with three little groups. So write a thesis statement, either the counter argument style or the enthymeme style at the top of the page. Yeah. Yeah, you can talk about yeah, hard academic work. That'd be fine. <laughs> Wait, 
it's just anything related to hard work. Anything, yeah, related to hard work. What argument do you think would be the most important for you to make? Sorry, are we So let me just re touch my skin. That's why you there isn't like a very specific prompt for this. Imagine you had to write an op-ed for the newspaper. Those are argument essays. You had to write an op-ed for the newspaper about hard work. And you were basing it just on our discussion today, what you're most interested in. What do you think people need to hear the most about hard work? What do you think is the most interesting part? That's your Yeah, or you can make it more specific. You can say, you can talk about essential workers or students or yeah, however you want to approach that. And Elsa, put this one in the chat box for me. So you two, we are writing a thesis about hard work. Whatever you think was most interesting about our discussion, you're finding an argument with that. I'm writing a thesis statement. Yeah, I'm going to 
needs to hear first from you and build from there. Okay, so I'm going to give you three minutes just to do the little outline. Yeah. Okay. So that means like don't use proper language, just sort of like show which ideas you'll go in order. Okay. Three. Ready? Go.
Okay, so wherever you get to in that three minutes, then it's probably time to start actually writing the essay because you kind of have this plan of how it's going to go at that point. And if you don't fully finish an outline, um, when it comes in a, in to a timed scenario, um, that's okay because as you're writing, you'll be thinking about what's coming next and you'll be able to kind of fill it in as you go. Yeah. Yeah, your hand really hurts at the end. But you've got adrenaline, so. <laughs> yeah, it's, so it's 40 minutes for rhetorical analysis. So then you get like a minute break? 40 minutes for argument and, and, um, 55 for synthesis yeah so they will say yes so they will say they'll say okay it's suggested that you move on now but you don't have to so if you wanted to spend 50 minutes on your rhetorical analysis and 30 minutes of your argument you could but i always suggest that you don't do that that you just spend the right amount of time yeah um so if you're writing the outline where do you write the right i know they only look at like portions of I would just write on the packet. Yeah, you have to pay $100 for it, so it's yours. <laughs> so, I mean, you probably already paid, right? So, yeah, you can write on that. I would just write it right underneath the prompt because then that gives you another chance to write your intro and potentially rewrite your thesis when it's the real essay. Yeah, Luke? I think as long as they don't make noise. Yeah. Yeah, I think. I think you can have a watch as long as it doesn't make noise. On the ACT, if your watch is not capable of making noises, they let you keep it. But there's also a clock in there. Unless we have a lot of people this year, it might be split between that. Okay, everybody open your American Dream packet now. And you're gonna find you're gonna find address to the nation on Labor Day by our favorite president Richard Nixon. Uh, I actually love Richard Nixon. I do I find him fascinating. I mean kind of because of He is an interesting person. <laughs> Page 26, but I don't believe they are numbered. And then you can go and Oh, Elsa, this is on this is on that canvas assignment I, I uh, added you to address the nation. Okay, so Address to the Nation on Labor Day. It's near the front. Okay, let me pay your attention. So this is a speech that Nixon gave um, in 71. So talk, um, and he's going to be talking about the value of hard work in this, in this speech. Um, one of the things that I, I think I mentioned this that we struggle with is that you have you just haven't had a whole lot of experience yet to pull from when it comes to argument essays so it's really hard like to just pull it out of thin air and add it to your essay this can be one of those things that could help back up some of your arguments about hard work so as you're reading it look for any sort of information that he gives or any sort of perspective he has that you might be able to use as an example in your hypothetical again little hard work thing that we're working on so you can write on these they're yours and I'm going to give you. I think we can. I think we can read this in about five minutes. We have a certain You got four of them. Oh. Oh. <laughs> no, there will be multiple topics, just like before, where you. Yeah. Okay, let's have it silent in here while everybody reads this speech no you're just looking for anything mark mark anything that you think might work in your essay
70s really tough time economically, and so I think it just called to their own attention that no, there's not always this much money in the bank account. Often there is, though. A lot of presidents have. But, you know. Yeah. Okay, wherever you are in that reading, that's okay. He he keeps kind of talking about the same thing a little bit and the value of hard work. Look at your outline now. Is there a place where you could reference Richard Nixon and his speech on Labor Day? Because this is a very famous speech, actually. Is there a place where you could use this speech to back up your ideas? Okay. Yeah, and that works in your paper? Is there a spot where that could work? Oh, I, I thought you were talking about Yeah, yeah. It's like what I want you to do now is I want you to look at any spot in his speech. It doesn't have to be the speech overall. It could be some small point that he is making here. And I want you to see where it could fit into your argument. If you really can't find a place for it, that's okay. Like I know Tenley's is about dance and maybe she can't fit in Richard Nixon into her essay about dance, you know? But I want you to try and see if you could. Um, and even if that is goes into substantiating, you were gonna say like the counter argument, right? It kind of goes against what you were saying. like. That's okay because it's really good to have an example for your counter argument as well. So find a spot in your little in your little outline where it might work. Yeah. Yes, it could. You could like you you could kind of use his words against him. Yeah. We're just writing it in. Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't clear about that. It's going to be one of your options for the next argument essay. So if you want to write it, you can. Same with the one we did last time. No, that one was for the. Ignore me for a second. <laughs> I'm seeing where you can plug him in. And if there isn't a place, don't make it awkward. You don't have to use him. I'm going to give you another resource here too. In every essay you ever write, you just make sure to mention oh, Richard sorry. Nixon. <laughs> Maybe next year. I really do admire him in some ways. Like he was. Maybe next year I'll have a. Piece he was of ruthless, but I'll try to use him like every single essay. People should use him in their graduation speech, oh. as Richard Nixon once said. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so well. For Dr. Brown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like he was—he helped relations with China, and he passed great. He took us to the moon. Okay. We're going to read one more now. This one's much shorter. So it's the one right after called the work ethic. And I want to show you kind of a counter argument here. So this is the work ethic by William Sapphire. It's the one right after, right? Sapphire. Satire by Sapphire. Okay, I think this will take us a couple of minutes. Let's just read through this one on, on our own again. Yeah. You want me to read it to you? Oh. Okay, sure. I will read it to you. Story time from the New York Times. Okay. Yeah, can we all just like go forward? All right. So as I'm reading this again, you are looking for moments in this essay that could apply to your own argument. Okay. Uh, Aristotle, who knew his ethics, held labor in contempt. All paid employments, he wrote, absorb and degrade the mind. The ancient Greeks, who left labor to slaves and believed that a good man lived a life of leisurely contemplation, would agree with the modern philosophy of Greening of America, Charles Reich, who holds no person with a strongly developed aesthetic sense, a love of nature, a passion for music, a desire for reflection, or a strongly marked independence could possibly be happy in a factory or white collar job. 
then what is all this about a work ethic? Where did the idea come from that labor is good and sloth is bad? Max Weber, who's German, the German sociologist who first used the word charisma about political candidates, advanced a controversial thesis in 19 under, 1904 under the title, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. Weber pointed out that money making was despised and money lending was considered fit only for Shakespearean Shylocks until well into the Middle Ages. Then along with the Protestant Reformation came the doctrine of vocation, which held that every man could serve God through his calling or work. John Calvin went Martin Luther one better. He taught his followers that success in business was evidence that God was smiling on a man's efforts and that the hard work, diligence and abstemiousness, abstemiousness, there we go, that led to the accumulation of wealth led also to the gates of heaven. The spirit of capitalism was thus conceived and the Calvinist Puritans brought that spirit of industry and grim purpose with them to the new world. With noses and shoulders to the grindstone and wheels, the people who believed that loafing was sinful and hard work was virtuous proceeded to build a good life in a great nation. The criticism of the Protestant ethic begun by Weber 70 years ago is now being echoed by people who want no part of what they consider the business world's rat race. Its defense has been taken up by labor leaders and other conservatives, including Mr. Nixon. Keep religion out of it, the president told a writer who labeled it the Protestant ethic for a Labor Day address in 1971. Let's just call it the work ethic. So this was written in 73. It's like this response to Nixon. Since directly opposing the word ethic would be like attacking motherhood, those who dispute its values proceed with circumspection. But Aristotle, Weber, and Reich have their followers. Who could help the debate by speaking out? The believers in what could fairly be called a leisure ethic could, if they were willing to work at it, present a persuasive case. If the work ethic is so popular, why has the work week been shortening? Why is the three-day weekend so clearly on the horizon? Oh, that one hurts. In the 70s, wow. they were plant they were working really hard to have a three-day weekend. And uh, we had it for a while during COVID. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So hard. All right. So clearly on the horizon. No, sir. No, Mr. Sapphire. <laughs> because some workers want more time to enjoy themselves and other workers want more time to improve themselves. Why not then treat work as something that should be as easy and quickly ended as possible so people could spend more time with their families out at the beach or pursuing their hobbies or studies. Life is short enough, the leisure ethic goes. Some noses were made for flowers, other for news, but none for grindstones. Hold on, the work ethic replies. That's not how to build character. If you do not have to work for anything, you wind up with nothing to value. Pride, self-respect, satisfaction, and achievement, all that comes only to the person who earns his leisure and his comforts by the sweat of his brow or the liveliness of his mind. Not so counters the leisure ethic, standing up for the right to recline. <laughs> the two groups working 80-hour weeks today are the unorganized migrant workers and the disorganized corporate executives, and their occupational bondage leads to physical and mental breakdowns, not the construction of character. The clash between the good life and the easy life is timeless. It will never be finally resolved, even if our descendants on the first Monday of the next millennium are fated to celebrate Leisure Day by plunging into the only day's hard work of the year. <laughs> Perhaps we will squeeze work down to a few minutes of super productive button pushing each day and thereby achieve what John Galbraith calls the elimination of toil. But I hope not. The way to hold on to all that is good about the work ethic is to make work itself more satisfying. This means the renewal of pride and craftsmanship. Today, a lost value, a chance for second careers after early retirement or refresher careers in the midst of work, the assumption by management of the responsibility to make jobs fulfilling, the dignifying of what is now dismissed as housework, the Hawthorne effect that flows from a worker's understanding that he is part of an attempt to improve his life on the job. Workers who resent dull, dehumanizing jobs have a saying, if a job is not worth doing, it is not worth doing well. Believers in the work ethic have a job worth doing and doing well. To, to apply imagination to the work experience itself and by so doing to preserve and extend a new work ethic in the American character. So what I like about this piece is it gives different angles here. He's talking about sort of the value of the hard work, the value of this leisure ethic, and ultimately how to make hard work more valuable to everyone. Here's one more thing I wanna read you, the next page. So this comes from a book what is it called though? Working, it's just called working. I didn't, did I put it on the top? No, no. No, so right on the top, this is working by a guy named, you'll like it. Is it the boys? 
Duds, Turkle. <laughs> Name your children studs. Studs Turkle. Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. Not Why you like the boys? Yeah. All right. I'm just gonna read the first paragraph of this, and then if it's gonna work for your essay, you can read more. So it says, so this was from a, um, an oral history of people who work. Um, so Studs Terkel was this guy who like went around the country and interviewed people from all different walks of life and just like compiled these short interviews into a book. Um, he did this for a lot of different subjects and this was, a subject, this was on working. It says this book being about work is by its very nature about violence to the spirit as well as to the body. It is about ulcers as well as accidents about shouting matches, as well as fist fights, about nervous breakdowns, as well as kicking the dog around. It is, it is above all, or beneath all, about daily humiliations. To survive the day is triumph enough for the walking wounded among the great many of us. Yeah. So he has a fairly negative <laughs> feeling about work. <laughs> so, um, and like I said, if you wanna read on for yours, you can. So now you've got three sources. You've got Nixon on one side praising this work ethic. You've got Sapphire who's seeing it like a little bit both ways, ultimately saying just having this sort of like um, blanket statement about hard work doesn't work, uh, does, doesn't it satisfy. Um, <laughs> and then you've got Studs Terkel who is like work sucks and no one's going to tell me otherwise, right? So you've got these three different viewpoints. See if you can fit at least two of them into your essay. See where they could, they could belong.
Oh, good. Elsa left. <laughs> oh, yeah. 